questions. Our next speaker um, is going to be talking about functionalizing the cancer genome, and uh, Linda Chin from Harvard uh, School of Medicine is going to be the speaker. Thank you, Mark. And thank you uh, to the organizer for the opportunity to speak here. It's an honor. I want to talk a little bit about the effort in TCGA and what I believe are uh, important next steps to understand and translate the information to impact on medicine. To start, as Dr. Lipton did, I'd like to remind all of us why we are here. Um, our goals in cancer medicine, which is to prevent cancer, detect it early, because there's no question that that's where we have the biggest impact on survival, and when that fails, intervene appropriately. And we have heard today that cancer really ultimately is a disease of the genome, and therefore it makes sense that if we could understand what the genome is telling us, we can do a better job in managing the patient, and that is what, in, in my view, what personalized medicine is. Now, there's evidence that genomics already impact on uh, science, and I want to highlight a few examples here. Certainly, we can start out with the example of bcr abel the Philadelphia chromosome, that taught us uh, the power of targeted therapy, uh, and the Herceptin example uh, that show us that we really need a biomarker that allows us to select the right patient population uh, for a drug to be effective. And certainly, um, the poster child, uh, the BRAB mutation, which really was discovered uh, by uh, probably the first systematic cancer genomic efforts, leading to effective drugs that's likely to be approved uh, this year, so that's merely eight years from target discovery, uh, sorry, target discovery uh, to a drug, lightly approved drug, and that compares to the example of Gleevec, which took 41 years from discovery of the target uh, to uh, drugs in the clinic. So, given that, I think it's clear that cancer genomic can impact dramatically on medicine. It will enable a more rational and effective approach to prevention, uh, which is targeting the underlying etiology. It would certainly help us detect uh, cancer early on uh, by targeting, and uh, in a rational way, targeting the known allele that occurs early, and applying technology, such as serum proteomic or imaging. And when that fell and the patient comes in with cancer, uh, we focus a lot of our efforts on uh, using the genome information to guide us to new therapeutic targets, and biomarkers that allow us to select the right population of patients uh, for that target, uh, for drugs against that target. And ultimately, uh, it's quite clear that monotherapy is not going to be uh, effective. It's not going to give us long-term cure. Uh, therefore, we need to begin to think about combination, co-extinction strategy, and, and learning from the genome will give us a rational way to go about doing that. So, it is with that hope, expectation, uh, that uh, the NIH, NHGRI, and NCI have come together and launched the pioneering efforts, the TCGA. The pilot project ran from 2006 and 2009, and I would say it, is definitely, it was definitely the first effort, coordinated effort, where there is uh, intention to characterize the cancer um, not just on one dimension, but multiple dimensions, not just looking at copy number change or not just looking at sequence alteration, but really try to understand what the expressions are, both the coding and non-coding, and also, in fact, trying to uh, map the promoter methylation patterns in the same sample. And that project had moved on, and I got this um, uh, recent update from the NAGI um, I, I believe that council update. Uh, the pilot ended in 2009 and it was continued uh, based on the success of that uh, in its phase two. And the phase two have gone and, and this is a plot of the sample that's entering TCGA uh, provided from the NCI office uh, where we are right on track to complete the 3,000 cases to study in the phase two project which will be uh, cases from these 20 tumor types from diverse organ system. And there's a very aggressive and ambitious plan to complete these comprehensive analysis of each of these 20 tumor projects by 2014, I guess that's what it says. And the current study design of the TCJ is that all, every one of these tumor samples and the match normal will get whole exome sequence 
and a good percentage of them whole genome in addition to uh, sequencing the transcriptome, the microRNA, and mapping the methylation patterns. And we're also beginning to layer in proteomic analysis on some uh, portion of these samples. So we are really trying to build a comprehensive map of what the genomes is, uh, what the transcriptome is, and, and hopefully linking it to what the proteome is. Now, how is this all possible? We have heard a lot about uh, earlier today. It is being made possible uh, by the um, transforming technology, the so-called next-gen sequencing or massively parallel sequencing technology, which I'm not going to uh, go into. You heard a lot about it already today. But one thing that hasn't been mentioned a lot beyond the cost is the fact that this technology doesn't just give us cheaper sequence. It gives us a lot more information and much more accurate information. Uh, this is a slide that I borrowed from Getty Gast from the Bro, and it really highlights what the next-gen sequencing technology can do. It certainly can identify poor mutation and small insertion and deletion, but it can do it much more sensitively and more accurately than the uh, old capillary-based sequencing methods. Um, it could also do copy number, uh, like the array-based technology, but in contrast to that, it will do it with digital quantitation. It will tell you precisely what the copy number of that particular sequence is, which the array-based technology is not able to do. And importantly, it will give us one new dimension of information, which is rearrangement, uh, that the previous technology, we were completely blind to uh, with the previous technology. This is the first time we'll be able to uh, map the rearrangement down to base pair accuracy uh, in a high throughput manner. And then beyond that, we can begin to interrogate uh, evidence for non-human pathogen sequences and their roles in human disease. And, and certainly there's a lot of evidence in clinical medicine that um, infectious etiology uh, plays a role in human disease. So we already heard about how um, much the sequencing costs have come down. And Eric Lanter have shown that how much the production of sequencing data was uh, have changed at the Bro Institute. And, but I'd like to use this slide, which I got from NAGI, uh, to show uh, how this is also changing the way we can think about what cancer genomic can do. This is a little piece of advertisement I pull out from the company Illumina that advertised that their machine, HiSeq 2000, in one single run, which takes eight days, can generate 200 gigabases of sequence. And this is a plot from NHGRI uh, reporting on their annual sequencing production for fiscal 2007. This is from all of their sequencing center. I believe not just cancer sequencing, all of their sequencing output in 2007, and the total is 140 gigabases. That level of growth, uh, which have continued, and I believe this is way off probably, tenfold less than what actually happened in 2010 because this was a projection earlier in the second quarter of 2010. This growth has changed the way we can think about what we can do with cancer genomic. We are no longer limited, I think, by the real state that we can sequence on. We don't have to choose between number of samples we need to provide the statistic power versus how many genes we can sequence. We can do them all uh, with this technology. And that really, and, and I think we just heard from Brad Bernstein that we can apply this similar to the epigenome. So it really has transformed the way we can think about and we can look at the uh, genome at a level that we never imagined possible. But it also created a lot of challenges, uh, certainly storing data, transferring them, um, not to mention mapping them. Uh, and then you have to analyze, mix sequence variance call, uh, calling, determining translocation and rearrangement. None of this is easy. None of them was easy and is still not easy and is still an evolving science. And on top of that, uh, the, the rate of growth is enormous. I guess I forgot to show this. This is the latest uh, accounting from TCJ alone. The sequencing output per month is about 17 terabytes. So this is enormous challenge, not just to deal with the data, process them, map them, but also to make sense out of them. And someone earlier this morning already mentioned and asked the question about the cost of analysis, and that clearly is a major battle, uh, bottleneck. And recognizing that, I think the phase two of TCJ have began, uh, at its inception, have anticipated some of this, although I don't think it anticipated the amount uh, of the challenge, but certainly 
It differed from the pilot in the sense that it had uh, uh, built and funded dedicated genome data analysis center. So it was no longer just a collection of centers that generate data. It actually had data center, uh, center that are really devoted to analysis. And moreover, um, the center together are, are really trying to think up way to accelerate making sense and analysis of data, such as building automated analysis pipeline. And here's an example of the TCJ analysis pipeline that's based on the BRO, where we try to automate uh, and have fast turnaround predefined analysis, an example of being able to ingest all the available data, over 2,000 uh, data files, into a, a pipeline that can do uh, normal, uh, analyze each of data types, generate analysis for each single data type in addition to correlated data types, such as which mutation is significantly correlated with uh, survival, for example, in that particular cohort, and do so in a predefined automated way, providing a very fast turnaround with results that's human readable so that this can serve as a companion to the raw data that's released to the public because majority of community, which I'll come back to, need to use this data and validate them and functionalize them, but they, it's, very, it's a challenge for them to make sense out of the enormous raw data. So the analysis is, uh, is important. Moreover, I think by automating and putting this in the pipeline, it provides reproducible uh, and, and uniform intermediate data files uh, that can free up the analysts in TCJ and outside of TCJ to do higher level analysis, such as trying to figure out what the meanings of a, uh, um, a mutation and its relationship uh, to uh, genes that's known to be in the same complex that might be altered by methylation or by genomic alteration. They can focus more on that type of analysis that's really aimed to understand a biological question or answer a clinical need, uh, and so that we can uh, accelerate the process. So with that and, and with all the um, uh, uh, talks you have heard earlier today, I think it's safe to say that with the effort of TCGA, along with our international colleague, ICGC, in the next five, 10 years, we will have a complete atlas of all the somatic alterations and somatic epigenome alterations in the cancer genome of all major cancer types. But then the challenge is how do we go from here to here? And it's obviously not a single step. And, and what it takes is a lot of work. And it was uh, called the uh, valley of death or a big gap. Um, and I think one of the things that I think we need to begin to think about is how to take all this information and do it in an effective and efficient way to support and, and make that knowledge actionable uh, and translatable in the clinic. And one of the examples that I like to remind you before I go to this example is um, I mentioned at the beginning that the BRAF mutation and development of BRAF in inhibitor is certainly the poster child that we like to think about and we like to see many of that coming out uh, because of the short time la lag between discovery and a drug that's impacting on patient survival. But I think we need to remember that that process would not happen in eight years if we didn't have the prior knowledge that BRAF is a kinase, that P BRAF signal in the MAP kinase signaling pathway, and phospho-MEC is a good downstream reporter of BRAF activity that one can use as a target engagement and responder ID throughout the entire process of drug development uh, in um, um, uh, process. So without that knowledge, we wouldn't be able to develop the drug. So for many of the genes that we are identifying now, we really don't have a clue as to how they function and what they do or whether even the enzymatic activity is there. So we need to get that knowledge. And there are no easy way to do it, and I'm not sure there's a high throughput way of doing it, but I want to now give an example of a study uh, that we have um, been working on that I hope to highlight the value of taking the next step, functionalizing, not just showing activity, but actually understand how a genetic element functions in cancer and how that information is necessary uh, to make it a translationable uh, observation. So this is a paper published by TCGA a couple years ago 
uh, defining, using his data, that glioblastoma really represents at least four major molecular subtypes, which are defined here, um, such as pluronero, classical, mesenchymal, and they all are enriched for specific genotypes, such as the classically uh, VGFR, EGFR V3 mutation that we are known, that's known to associate with glioblastoma. It's really only seen in the classical subtype. The IDH1 mutation that has been mentioned earlier uh, is almost exclusively observed in the proneural subtype and so on. Now, one of the things that we were interested in, uh, at least someone uh, in the uh, lab, uh, Johnny, a postdoc fellow, was interested in was what is the difference? What's driving the molecular differences between these subtypes? You can look at the transcription of these GBM using the TCJ data, and interestingly, you found that the major difference on the, on the transcriptome level, it really exists between, you can't barely see here, mesenchymal and proneural subtype. So here in the hypothesis that, uh, that maybe some microRNA is regulating a collection of genes, and that's really underlying the molecular differences between proneural and mesenchymal. So it's a, it's a hypothesis, but how do you go about testing them? Well, we know we have these data, very complex data from TCJ, and we need to make sense of it. And this is where computational modeling become valuable. And we went to our collaborator, Jim Collins at BU, and asked him to help us develop and use his uh, CRR network modeling algorithm, which I'm not going to go into, to try to build a, um, a regulatory map of microRNA and RNA in glioblastoma, which we did with his help, uh, using this about 200 samples, which were matched RNA and microRNA data. And this is here the value of doing the integrated genomics in TCJ. You cannot do this analysis if your RNA and microRNA data are generated on different sets of samples. Uh, through, with the network algorithm, we you know, generate the fur ball that, that represent the network, uh, which by itself is not very useful. There are 29,000 edges among you know, several hundred microRNA and thousands of messenger RNA. But we had a question that we wanted to use this for. So that make this, uh, so that we know how to use this information. We take these uh, network relationships and we ask, how is that different between proneural and mesenchymal? And without going into a lot of detail, we identify 70 microRNA that really drive the separation of, between proneural and mesenchymal. And you can see that all the messenger RNA edges connected to these 17 microRNA really account for 85 90% of the genes that make up for the signature genes uh, reported by, uh, by the TCJ paper to define the proneural versus mesenchymal subtype. So now you can go in and ask, what are these 17 microRNA doing? And most of them are unknown. But I'll give you one example. We decided to focus on one of them. Uh, which is mir 34 a and, and with the hypothesis, well, because it's also a microRNA that has evidence that in some tumor type it's deleted, it's in the region of loss. It expressed a very low level in the proneural subtype, which fit our hypothesis, and its CR edges are enriched for proneural signature, which I'm not showing you. So that led us to the hypothesis that mir 34 a can be a candidate determinant of the proneural molecular subtype. So the first thing we have to do is first prove that mir 34 a actually does something in glioblastoma. And we can do that very quickly by proving that it is a tumor suppressive mir. Okay, so we can do this such as loss of function study in human glioma cell where we overexpress the mir and show that we eliminate some uh, tumorigenicity of these cells in vivo. We can do the converse, which is to use decoy knockdown expression of mir 34 a in a immortalized human astrocyte and show that now they become transforming and tumorigenic. So, and we can do this in multiple cell system, in human, in mouse system. So we prove that mir 34 a is a tumor suppressor in glioblastoma. But that information is not very helpful. There's not much more we can do with that information. So we decided to go a little deeper and say, how does mir 34 a contribute to the proneural versus mesenchymal signature? Now, this is perhaps a simplistic view to think about regulation between microRNA and RNA, but we can certainly think that there could be direct interaction where the microRNA directly bind to the target gene and negatively regulates expression, but it also could do so through intermediates, such as transcription factor, where you get a very different relationship. Still, a relationship that you can see in the network model, but it wouldn't be the same kind of negative correlation. So I'm not going to talk about this. I will just talk about our effort to focus on this putative direct target or mir 34 a through using sequence analysis and correlation, 
Um, we identified two putative direct targets of MIA-34A, and, and the criteria we use is down here. Now, using one of the, one of the things that we are aware of is the sequent prediction is very, have very high false positive rate. So what we are asking here is that we only focus on predicted targets that are predicted by all three algorithms. Now, we went on to prove, and I'm not going to show you the data, by luciferate reporter assay that DL1 and PD G PDGFRA are indeed um, direct targets regulated by MIR-34A uh, through direct binding, and we can show regulation of, on protein level by MIR-34A of these two target genes in human and mouse cells. So they're clearly novel direct target of MIR-34A. What does that mean? Is that relevant? Well, the reason that we were interested in this is because what we know about glioblastoma. This is an old review. It's very old from 2007. Really needs an update now. Uh, but it shows here uh, a point that I want to make. Glioblastoma is clinically defined as two types, primary or de novo glioblastoma versus secondary, which progress from antecedent low-grade glioma. Over five, 10 years, it becomes the same similarly aggressive glioblastoma multiforme. The classical signature gene associated with low-grade low glioma that progress to secondary GBM is PDGFRA. And what's not shown here is through work of uh, Wogelstein's group and then the molecular uh, uh, classification paper from TCGA, we know that these secondary GBM are the GBM that has IDH1 mutation. They are of the proneural subtype. So in other words, PDGFRA is expected and is uh, a signature gene of proneural subtype GBM. With respect to not signaling, which is uh, 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 what DL1 regulates, we can see that, um, actually, I don't show here, Heidi Phillips' paper actually shows that NOx is activated in both classical and proneural subtype GBM, and we can see that signature also in the TCGA data. So we know that MIR-34A is low in proneural subtype GBM, and it upregulates, because it's low, Notch and PDGFRA sing, uh, signaling in proneural GBM, which we do see in human tumor. So we can see that human relevance. But there's another important point. How do we know that this relationship we can see in silico through some artificial assay where we do reporter assay to show they truly interact. We do artificial overexpression or knockdown studies to show that one can regulate the other. I would say all of these are artificial. How do we know that these things really happen in vivo? Well, it's not that easy to go in vivo to test this because not only can we not do it in cell line, and cell line themselves are limited, for proneural GBM, this is particularly problematic because there is no known proneural cell lines. And I think after many years searching, there's probably one cell line that has IDH1 mutation uh, that's out there. So majority of models, cell model system, are not proneural. And that's where the mouse genetically engineered model becomes useful. Uh, the Pinos lab had published two years ago a P53, P10 uh, genetically engineered model that leads to spontaneous high-grade glioma. I'm not going to go into the details. So we took these mouse tumor and profiled them and asked, well, P53, P10 are seen in human proneural subtype GBM based on TCG data. And when we take the mouse tumor and profile them and ask what type of tumor are they, you can see that they are significantly enriched for proneural signature gene. In other words, the P10, P53 model is a proneural model GBM, and uh, consistent with that, MIR-34A expression is very low in these tumor, and PDGFRA is overexpressed. And in fact, this is a IHC from the paper showing that in the tumor part of the brain, you see high level activation of PDGFRA, which you don't see in normal brain. And, and we can show in this system that MIR-34A does regulate PDGFRA. And same thing in, uh, with NOx signaling. We can use the gel model, the P53, P10 cell, and show that when MIR-34A is knocked down and they form tumor, those tumors have high evidence, a uh, high level activation of NOx signaling. So what that means is that by using the model system, the in vitro system we have, uh, based on in silico prediction data, uh, uh, starting with the, in, uh, the sort of multidimensional data from TCJ using a network modeling, we formulated a hypothesis. That is, MIR-34A defines a subset of tumor 
and this observer tumor look like proneural, and they activate, they have concurrent activation of both NOT and PDGFRA. And now this is, uh, and we can show in the in vivo model uh, that simulate human uh, proneural GBM that this does happen in a, a real tumor. So that gives us a framework to understand how MIR-34A may be contributing to molecular signature of proneural subtype. And importantly, it gives us a hypothesis that we can test, a hypothesis that says perhaps MIR-34A defines a subtype of glioblastoma that's sensitive to uh, combined inactivation of NOTCH and PDGFRA, and there are actually drugs targeting both of these pathways in clinic. So this is an example where starting with a biological question, leveraging TCJ data, and really uh, using high-level computational mining to develop a framework to test the hypothesis, but at the end is understanding how the event contributed to tumor to lead to a hypothesis that's translatable. Now, this remains to be tested, but it is a testable hypothesis, and it may uh, lead to translational impact. So what I hope to show with that one example is that we can do cancer genomic. I think the technology is here, the capability is here, but let's not underestimate the challenge of analysis, not just bioinformatic analysis, but higher level computational analysis that formulate hypotheses, provide framework for experimental testing and understanding of mechanism, and ultimately is that understanding that lead to actionable information that we can translate. Now, translation is not easy, um, but we need to also focus on doing this part. In the last minute, I want to come back to this little box here and just say something really quickly. Yes, we can get sample, we can profile the sequence, the tumor, and, and generate cancer genomic data, but how we, what type of sample we sequence and how we collect the sample and what information we know about sample is also an important aspect. Uh, it's not easy to do, but we need to think about it uh, because I will give you one example. Right now, a lot of the community's effort really focus on identifying new target and new biomarkers. But we have to remember that there's another really important um, impact that genomic can play, which is improving the way we manage the early stage diagnosed patients. Why is this important? Because that's our majority. Majority of our patients are diagnosed at low stage. They currently are treated by surgery and, 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 and triage based on pathology and clinical staging, and much of our cutting edge effort focus on the tip of the iceberg. Now, that's not that that's not important, but we shouldn't forget this. And the reason is we need to do a better job. I think this was supposed to be animated, I forgot, because um, what we, we know clinically is the pathologic and clinical staging cannot identify all the patients uh, that can be cured by surgery alone. 10 to 15 percent have inherently poor uh, prognosis, and they need additional therapy in adjuvant setting, but we have no way of identifying those patients. What we need now is that we need molecular characteristics to identify that for us, such as, um, uh, well, I'm going to skip this part, such as a paper that is in the same issue, this tweak in nature, identifying prognostic markers that can identify uh, prostate patients diagnosed with prostate cancer and identifying their risk of recurrence so that we can enlist them more appropriately into therapy or not. That has tremendous healthcare economic as well as quality of care impact. So how does genomic help here? I think we need to think about evolution of cancer genome differently. It, it, I think a lot of data now show that it doesn't happen as a serial stochastic event where you pick up one event, you become early stage cancer, you pick up another mutation, now you become more aggressive and so on. In fact, we know through genomic study and some mechanistic study that at the transition point from benign to malignant, these tumor cells already have numerous alterations in their genome and depends on the hand that they are dealt with, they are either inherently very aggressive or they inherently benign. That's not to say they couldn't acquire more events, but they are predestined at the beginning to behave a certain way, which means if we can get at this early stage cancer, understand what the genome is, and identify the genomic event that predicts poor outcome or aggressive behavior, we can identify the high risk patient among the early diagnoses and, and provide them with appropriate adjuvant therapy and spare the one that can be cured 
without uh, toxic downstream therapy. Now, one other point that I was going to take out, but I do want to mention that, that uh, Dr. Lipton mentions is that in order to do this, we can sequence many human patients, early stage cancer to find what's different between the aggressive and benign. But these are early stage tumors. They are tens more than the late stage disease. And you have to have very long follow up to know whether they had good or poor prognosis. This is where the extreme case becomes really helpful and we can get to the extreme case using genetically engineered model where we engineer them to have black and white outcome. And that can serve as a starting point and leveraging evolution conservation as another way to get us in to a, a shorter list of candidates which we can then take them into functional study, identify one that can truly drive metastasis, and then turn out these are also oncogenic by themselves, so they're really true uh, therapeutic target as well. And importantly, we have shown, at least in our study, that these are not, as expected, not just prognostic. In a particular lineage, they could be cross-lineage prognostic. This is an example of uh, metastasis gene that we identify an early stage melanoma that can be prognostic in melanoma, but they turn out to can also be prognostic in three different cohorts of breast cancer, suggesting there are some fundamental process that early stage cancer cells have. If they have those genetic events, they are wired to behave more aggressively, whether they are in the skin or the breast microenvironment. So at the end, I want to say that let's not forget that cancer genomic can impact here to identify prognostic molecular-based markers to complement our standard of care, which is pathologic and clinical staging. And since these tumors are deregulated early stage cancer, they can be identified as bona fide prognostic biomarker and therapeutic target. And importantly, since they, we can identify the functionally active run, and through mechanistic study, we can also predict what the right therapy is that uh, the patient would most likely benefit from in the adjuvant setting. So I'll end here by saying uh, that I hope that we all believe and, and hope to see that cancer genomic will impact and lead us to genomic medicine or personalized medicine, but on different level, uh, not just in therapeutic target, but ultimately in early prevention, early detection, and management of early stage patients. I just want to say one more thing in terms of acknowledgement. The um, microRNA near 34 study started by Johnny with Isla from Jim Collins' lab, uh, aided by Sache, who's our computational biologist, and, and also our team at the Bro, who um, really work on the analysis pipeline. Thank you.